And uh, we go on to the third, the second rebuttal, sorry, by uh, Stephen Law. I'm giving you an extra 30 seconds, Stephen, because there was a brief malfunction with the timer uh, that amounted to about 30 seconds extra. So if you'd like to come, we'll hear your third rebuttal. OK. Uh, at this point, I want to actually look at the arguments that were given for the existence of God. Uh, there were actually only two that are relevant here in terms of, showing, of, of being arguments for a good God as opposed to, say, a morally neutral God or an evil God. Uh, Craig's moral argument is, if God does not exist, objective moral values do not exist. Objective moral values exist, therefore God exists. The vast majority of philosophers reject this argument. Take, for example, the Christian philosopher, Professor Richard Swinburne of Oxford University. Swinburne says, I cannot see any force in an argument to the existence of God from the existence of morality. So Professor Craig is putting up against a mountain of evidence against what he believes, that provided by the problem of evil, an argument that even one of the world's leading Christian philosophers finds utterly unconvincing. If Professor Craig wants nevertheless to run his moral argument, the onus is clearly on him to show that its premises are true. In fact, both premises are highly questionable. The first premise is again rejected by the vast majority of moral philosophers. What argument does Professor Craig offer for supposing that it is nevertheless true? It appears to be uh, to point out that an evolutionary explanation of why we believe rape is objectively morally wrong wouldn't make rape objectively morally wrong. Well, so what? I mean, we all knew that already. Uh, that doesn't show that the belief isn't or cannot be true given atheism. Remember, the onus is on Professor Craig to show that no atheist-friendly account of the objective truth of moral claims can be given. The fact that evolution provides no such account very obviously does not entail no such account can be given. The onus is on Professor Craig to show that all such atheist-friendly accounts are wrong, even the ones we haven't thought of yet. And don't forget, as theists so regularly do, that they needn't even be naturalistic accounts. <coughs> so, so far, Craig has shown one atheist-friendly account is wrong. As I say, we knew that already. What if the second premise of Craig's moral argument, objective moral values exist? This is undoubtedly a belief that just seems obviously true to us. And indeed, I'll put it forward quite happily, but I'm willing to take it back later if I need to. Okay? Objective, uh, the mere fact that it seems true doesn't guarantee that it's true. It seems like there are objective moral values. That isn't a belief we should abandon easily, but it's by no means irrefutable. Right? After all, we have a powerful impression that the Earth doesn't move. It doesn't, I mean, it really, really doesn't seem to move. But if we're given powerful evidence that it does move, and it's also explained why it nevertheless seems like it doesn't move, then the rational thing for us to believe is that our initially highly convincing impression was wrong. The moral is, even if Professor Craig could show that his first premise is true, he can't deal with the problem of evil by just digging in his heels and saying, but look, it really, really seems to us as if there are objective moral values, so there must be a God. When placed next to the problem of evil, Craig's argument does little to undermine the problem. Rather, it just combines with it to deliver the conclusion that there are no objective moral values. That conclusion would be further reinforced by an evolutionary explanation of why it would still seem to us that there are objective moral values, even if there aren't. Now, I don't doubt Professor Craig doesn't want to believe that there are no objective moral values. Hey, I don't want to believe it, but this isn't an exercise in wishful thinking. So even if its first premise were true, and he, Craig could show that, and he hasn't, his moral argument still hardly offers much of a riposte to the evidential problem of evil. Let's now turn to the resurrection argument. It turns on claims made in the New Testament that there was an empty tomb, that there were independent eyewitness reports of Jesus alive after the crucifixion and so on. The claim is that the best explanation of these alleged facts is that Jesus was resurrected by God. You should always be suspicious of arguments to the best explanation in such contexts. Let me tell you a story from uh, 1967. It's a UFO story. There were reports of a strange object appearing nightly over a nuclear power site in Wake County. The police investigated. An off a police officer confirmed it was about half the size of the moon and it just hung there over the plant. The next night the same thing happened. 
the deputy sheriff described a large lighted object. The county magistrate saw, and I quote, a rectangular object looked like it was on fire. We figured it about the size of a football field. It was huge and very bright. There was, in addition, hard data, a curious radar blip reported by local air traffic control. Now, what's the best explanation of these reports? We have multiple attestation. We have trained eyewitnesses, police officers putting their reputations on the line by reporting a UFO. We have hard independent confirmation, that blip on the radar scope. Surely then it's highly unlikely these witnesses were, say, all hallucinating or lying or just saw a planet. Clearly, by far the best explanation, you might think, is that they really did see a large lighted object hovering close to the plant. But here's the thing. We know pretty much for sure that what was seen by those police officers was the planet Venus. Journalists arrived on the scene, were shown the object, and chased it in a car. They found they couldn't approach it. Finally, they looked at it through a long lens and saw it was the planet Venus. That radar blip was just a coincidence. What does this show? Every year, there are countless amazing reports of religious miracles, alien abductions, ghosts, and so on. In most cases, it's not easy to come up with plausible, mundane explanations for them. Sorry, it is easy to come up with plausible, mundane explanations for them. <laughs> but not all, right? Some remain deeply baffling. So should we believe in such things then? No, for as my UFO illustrate story illustrates, we all know that some hard to explain reports of miracles, flying saucers and so on are likely to crop up anyway, whether or not there's truth to these claims. That 1967 case could easily have been such a baffling case. So let's suppose that the biblical documents written a decade or more after the events they report, written exclusively by the devotees of a new religious movement, not even by first-hand witnesses detailing events for which there's pretty much no independent confirmation, constitutes really, really good evidence that there was an empty tomb and that the disciples did report seeing the risen Christ. Is that, in turn, good evidence that Jesus was resurrected? Evidence supports a hypothesis to the extent the evidence is expected, given the hypothesis is true and unexpected otherwise. The absolutely crucial point to note is this. We have good reason to expect some baffling, very hard to explain in mundane terms, reports to crop up occasionally anyway. Whether or not there are any miracles or gods or flying saucers. So the fact that an otherwise baffling, hard to explain case has shown up provides us with little, if any, evidence that a miracle has occurred. Stop there.